Stop laughing. Hello, my name is Augie, and I'm in my third year at Corpus Christi, Oxford, and I'm studying classics. Uh, yeah, and Augie's a very special guest because we've been friends for a long time because we went to school together. Uh, so yeah, we go way back. And yeah, so I've got a series of questions for you, Augie. Uh, some of them I collected from Instagram and others are just like basic Oxbridge admissions questions. Uh, so first mm -hmm. of all, you do classics. Can you tell us a bit about your course at Oxford? Yeah, so classics is the study of ancient civilizations, um, focusing on Greece and Rome particularly. And the thing that makes classics different to say classical civilizations or ancient history is that it's quite a lot about literature. And I think particularly at Oxford, there's quite a strong focus on literature and also language. So being able to translate um, Greek and Latin into English and to be able to read um, texts in those languages. Um, and the course itself is a four-year course, which is unusual for humanities degree. I mean, anywhere really. Um, so that's something special about it. I really like the fact that it's four years, um, especially this last year has been so disrupted by COVID that it's really quite a blessing to have an extra year of university. Um, but also, yeah, it's good because it has a kind of two-part structure where you do some more groundwork stuff in the first two years and then move on to more specialist um, subjects in your third and fourth year at Oxford. Mm, that's cool. I think at Cambridge, I might be wrong, but it's three years normally to do classics, but that's four right, years yeah. if you do it from scratch. Which A-levels did you do and which ones do you recommend for studying classics at Oxford, for example? So I did German, double maths and Latin. Yeah, so as, as for what A-levels are helpful if you are thinking about applying for classics, I definitely recommend, if your school does offer it, um, Latin, Greek, classical civilizations, anything like that. Um, but also things like history, English um, are quite common among people that I know study those subjects. Um, things like politics um, as well, kind of the kind of classic humanities type degrees are, are quite and philosophy maybe are quite frequent among people who study classics at university, but that's not at all to say that those are necessary. Um, I don't think there actually are any requirements, at least for Oxford, uh, for what A-levels you have to have taken. You just need three A's in, um, you know, three subjects. Also languages is a quite a common one. And I, I, I personally would recommend studying a language at A-level if you can, a modern language. Um, so yeah, me, doing German was really helpful uh, for not just for like studying Latin, they're not particularly related languages, but like still studying a language in depth as you do at A level is really helpful just for going on to um, study that at a degree where you really need to have a kind of strong understanding of um, of languages, maybe as a whole. Um, so yeah, absolutely would recommend that. And yeah, maths is a bit of an outlier, I guess. Not many people who study classics at university have done maths at A-level, and especially not double maths. Um, but I guess I chose maths because at the time I wasn't sure whether I wanted to apply for classics or a classics-related degree or maths. I mean, I was kind of undecided for some time. And I really enjoyed maths. And I also kind of felt that I should do maths uh, or something like that, you know, A-science based kind of STEM subject just because I thought yeah it would be a useful thing later in life and that's turned out to be true like um, I don't use maths in my degree as such very often but like the kind of way of thinking that you learn doing maths is is really helpful just for like any kind of analytical study of anything really um, so yeah I'd, I'd and actually I'd, having said that I, I did do a module in logic which didn't directly build on anything that I did in A-level, but like, as I said, the way of thinking was definitely uh, similar. And yeah, I'm grateful to have studied maths at A-level. Um, but yeah, just to reiterate that there really aren't any requirements for um, studying a classics degree at Oxford. Mm. Um, and I guess similarly, you don't need to have done classics or Latin or Greek GCSE. No, definitely not. Um, yeah, so I I had done Latin GCSE uh, by the time I did my A-levels. 
which is why I was able to do Latin A-level. Um, I also then took Greek GCSE during my A-levels. Again, it was offered on a kind of one-off basis. Um, and that actually did prove helpful later on because when I um, came to start learning Greek at Oxford, I should explain that if you haven't done either of the languages at A-level, then you will learn one language when you come to Oxford. If you have done one language at A-level, you will learn a new language, the other one. So let's say you've done Latin A-level, like me, um, I had to learn Greek uh, in Oxford and you reach a similar standard to your Latin by the end, by the kind of second year of your degree. Um, yeah, so, um, so actually studying Greek at GCSE, even that kind of relatively small amount compared to an A-level, but it was still helpful later when I had to learn Greek. Uh, whereas other people were learning from scratch. But as I said, by kind of second year, everyone's on about the same level. Mm -hmm. Do you think it's a good idea to maybe self-teach GCSE or A-level Latin or Greek if you want to study classics? GCSE, by all means, I think is quite manageable, especially if you are really keen on languages and have knowledge of other languages, then that's definitely an option and you should look into ways of kind of doing that a level i wouldn't recommend so much i mean unless you're i don't know super rainy but i don't think i could have managed like an extra a level on top of the ones i was already doing at school um i mean further maths was a bit different because it's kind of part of the maths degree but like you know three a levels is probably enough like um so yeah if you want to do that then go for it but as i as i said like it's really not necessary so the question is about personal statements. What was your personal statement about and what do you think a good classics personal statement should include? So mine was about a range of things. Um, I started with like some of the things I've been reading recently. Um, nothing particularly like scholarly or academic, just some kind of uh, historical fiction. So Robert Harris is a, is a writer who um, is is still alive and still writes today, but he wrote a trilogy about Cicero and kind of imagines the world through Cicero's eyes, um, actually through the eyes of his slave. And it's just really interesting about, he really explores the detail of that, of the period of the kind of uh, late Republic, uh, first century BC, um, and uses quite some rigorous historical methods to kind of like reconstruct it in a really entertaining and engaging way. So I talked a bit about him, um, in my opening and then I I talked about a trip to Rome I had with my family um lucky enough to actually visit the place where it all kind of well some of it all comes from um and talked about kind of a trip to the some of the archaeological sites there I also talked a bit about my EPQ uh, extended project qualification which you might have a chance to do at your school uh if you do then take the opportunity make the most of it try and just explore something that you're interested in uh, it's a really good opportunity um and then I just talked about like kind of my hobbies a bit not too much I, I kind of tried to relate everything to classics so for instance I, I love singing in choirs and I was able to talk about um how kind of singing in Latin is like brings it to life in a way which um just reading on a page doesn't uh sounds a bit corny but like um it's okay I mean it it, it was true like it, it, it wasn't just me trying to think desperately think of something to say like that's that's how I feel about it so um I guess that I guess that worked but um otherwise yeah I think it's hard to say because there's such a range of classics about how much experience people have had so some people would have done Latin and Greek A level at school They'll have had, they've been learning Latin since they were like in primary school, maybe some people, um, in which case it's going to be quite different to somebody who has kind of only just really discovered the subject and hasn't done it at a level, but um, really wants to kind of get stuck in at university and, um, and explore this new field. So if you're one of the latter people, then I think it's really important that you show that you have engaged in some way with with classics even if you haven't studied if you haven't had the opportunity to study at school like no one's going to penalize you for that at all like 
it's completely not your fault. Like, no one expects you to, as you mentioned earlier, like no one expects you to um, have done an A-level in your own time or something just because your school didn't offer it. Uh, it's all very fair and they'll take everything into account about your background. Um, so but I would say that like, if you haven't kind of made an effort to read about classics or to visit even just some archaeological sites like around the, you don't have to go to Rome or Greece but just places around you like the Romans obviously were in Britain so they they've left some things behind and you can there are things you can go and visit I'm not saying any of these are like you have to do but like things like that that, that show you're kind of engaged um are really important and of course if you do study a modern language then you should try and talk about that in your personal statement because the language especially Oxford is is a big part of it um, and to show that you kind of have a passion for languages as a whole would be ideal if yeah if languages aren't so much something that you really enjoy but you're just really interested in the culture and the literature then that's also fine just like make sure you show that you've kind of made an effort with like reading some Latin and Greek authors that you like um, maybe if you've kind of started doing some Latin at home like maybe or, or perhaps you've started learning the Greek alphabet or something you should definitely talk about that as well um, yeah just anything that you can show that you're really want to do classics and um, that you've kind of found the thing that's for you despite not having the opportunity to study it fully at, at school that's very helpful um, thank you and then next question is about your interview so what was it like and then also um, how would you recommend preparing for it? So my interview was uh, two parts. And within those two parts, uh, so one of them was language and literature, and the other one was history and philosophy. Um, so the language and literature one I'll talk about first, we, we were given a passage of Sappho, as well as a kind of modern poem about classics. Um, written in the 20th century, uh, as well as, I think maybe it was another passage, but I can't remember what it was. Um, and I, having not done much Greek before, I'd never really read Sappho or particularly knew anything about Sappho. So that was, we had to read, we had 20 minutes to read that before um, and to kind of come up with some thoughts about it. And then once I, uh, I was invited into the room and then we could, we had a chat about the, um, the passages that we were given to prepare um and yeah i came up with some stuff about papyri and that's probably boring didn't you say that um <laughs> yeah so we just had a chat about the text that we were given to study and um it was kind of quite wide ranging i suppose and they definitely weren't expecting you to know any Greek or to be able to translate it on the spot that's definitely not what they're testing like not at all um rather it was just to see how you kind of think about text how you think about literature um and yeah just to kind of explore where your where your brain where your interests are going to take the conversation and that's how it was it was just very much um relaxed like I, f I found that I could if I had knowledge about certain things like papyrology I could just that I picked up from random things, I could kind of bring that in um, naturally without having to like force it in. Um, and yeah, so that was that was really enjoyable. And then we just talked more generally about classics, about literature, about mythology. I remember that was something that came up. Um, and as I say, yeah, it was just a really enjoyable conversation. I came out feeling really quite good. Um, unsure if I would, you know, get in. Like I didn't know if I'd impress them but I enjoyed the experience and I I was thankful for the opportunity to kind of speak with these really clever, clever people. Um, so, yeah, and, and I enjoyed it so much. I was really hoping that I would get a place after that, like, um, and so I was, I was very happy when I did. And so then the other interview was a bit more like the kind of, well, not horror stories, but like it's a bit more kind of, scary Oxford interview type thing. So I was given a passage of Plato um, in the tutorial to look over. I had maybe five minutes to, to look over it. Um, 
and then the grilling began as it were like um this is what i'd kind of been told to expect uh, a bit more kind of probing um a bit more yeah forward kind of approach to um interview yeah a bit more rigorous maybe um and yeah i, I would say something and then the interviewer would say yeah but what do you mean by that and then i have to kind of explain myself and then i would say something else and he would say yes but can't don't you think this or like can't you how would you think about this or like what if i told you this you know things like that and it kept going and i at one point i just kind of started laughing because it was such a like <laughs> odd experience i still answered managed to answer is most of them uh, i probably said complete nonsense but um you know at least i got something out um and probably did a complete full circle and contradicted myself about five times but you know I survived it um so that was exhilarating but yeah but a bit more sort of scary um and the other half of that interview was very much like literally half and half time wise uh was about history and that was that's fun um i was given like a coin which came from corinth like ancient corinth and he asked me to identify like where i thought it was from i had no idea but like I saw a dolphin on it and I knew that Corinth was by the seaside. So I thought, oh, maybe Corinth. And yeah, I was right. So I was lucky, but I'm sure if I'd said something else that was sort of sensible, that wouldn't have been a, like a problem. Um, and we would have talked about it. Uh, and then we kind of had a more general discussion about history and archeology span and some of the stuff that was in my personal statement was brought up about actually visiting Rome. Uh, and there was a, kind of curveball question I guess which was if I remember it's like uh is there actually any value in visiting archaeological sites ourselves um and that's kind of yeah threw up all sorts of questions which I wasn't really expecting yeah so that's just an example of them like picking up something from my personal statement which might well happen um it's unlikely that they'll kind of tear it apart as you might have heard that's that wasn't my experience at all but um anything that you think or anything that they think you might be able to say something about or say something interesting about or something that you might have thought about which they want to explore then that might come up so I guess yeah be ready for that and, and as for how to prepare I'd say know your personal statement really well uh don't kind of you know send it off the night before and then not look at it until your interview that's probably not very helpful uh, you don't want to be in a situation where like something comes up they ask you something and you just like don't really know what they're no. you don't want to be in a situation where you've said something in your personal statement which you just don't know why you said it and you kind of look like a bit of an idiot in the tutorial um like there's it's quite likely that you will look like a bit of an idiot in the tutorial but like that shouldn't be because you haven't prepared like the preparation is is quite important um like they'll ask you hard questions but um if you've kind of done some thinking, then hopefully you'll be able to come up with something, uh, even if it's complete nonsense, but you know, at least at least you've come up with something, but you don't want to be stuck with nothing to say. That's not fun. Um, so yeah, in that sense, kind of preparing, reading, making sure you know. Also, I guess like if you've mentioned books, if you've mentioned like some work that you've done, like a project or an EPQ or something like similar, Again, have a read of that again. Uh, similar thing with the book. Like if someone, if if you put a book on your personal statement which you haven't actually read, that's not a good sign. And if they find out, which they probably will, um, that's not looking good for you. So yeah, just either read all the books that are on your personal statement or don't put many books on your personal statement if you haven't read many books. Like just don't, like, don't try and be dishonest because they will see through it. That's their job. One trick is that when you put in your personal statement, you haven't read it yet, but you read it after you submit it and before your interview, that is quite like a risky strategy. Yeah, that could work. Um, yeah. Uh, but also like, another thing is don't feel you need to shove all the, I think with classics, there's, there's an idea of the kind of canon. There's like, there's Homer and there's Virgil and there's all these like big, big names. And so some people feel that they have to have read Homer, they have to have read all of like Virgil's writing 
before they can like even think to like apply to Oxford, but that's just so not true. Like, uh, whatever you've read, even if even if like like me, you kind of you're into some more modern literature about about classics. Like that's very much equally valid, and um, if not more impressive, that you kind of think creatively about uh, literature and and what is yeah. If you can show that you kind of think for yourself and decide for yourself what you want to read like that's so much more valuable than just forcing yourself to read 15 books of homer so yeah i'd say that and otherwise the most important thing is not to panic in your interview um so having said that if you do start to panic don't worry about panicking like <laughs> just that's not going to help <laughs> yeah it's a good uh, point yeah yeah i think being in a good frame of mind is really important and whatever that takes like even if you you get if you get to a situation where like you realize you haven't read a book on the reading list or you just have no idea what like an author was trying to say and you but you're also feeling really stressed like don't try and like cram that knowledge on the night before the interview you just have a walk like go and hang out with the other interviewers and play a game or something or call your parents or whatever it is just just relax and don't don't go into that interview already kind of in a bad state of mind because um, it won't do you any favours and it, you risk the something happening where you um, you kind of seize up and you, you're so like distressed that you just don't have anything to say and of course the admission tutor will be understanding and they'll know that you're nervous but if, they, if you don't give them anything to go on then they, they can't kind of um, you know they can't really make a informed decision on you and it's it's you're not doing yourself any favors as i said um so really just make sure do do all you can to put yourself in a good frame of mind like look after yourself that's really important yeah i mean just try and enjoy it like um i came out of my interview went went home like not really knowing if i was going to get in or not um kind of doubting i would really um having having chatted to so many like clever people there i was like oh god there's no way i can I can get in um but I had such a great time like I got to know some really great people who I'm still friends with today uh and yeah even if you don't get in like it's so great to just have had that experience um because it is it's quite unique and yeah similarly the the, the, the fact that you've managed to have, like have a kind of interesting conversation with some academics who are at the top of their field that's also just something to be thankful for. Um, so yeah, try not to beat yourself up too much if you if you don't get an interview. Mm. Okay, well, that's very helpful. Uh, thank you. So after your interview, you got your offer. Uh, what was your offer? Uh, three A's. Three A's. I guess that excluded further maths or something like that. Yeah, cause, so in our school, we did maths A level, just the basic maths in year 12, freeing up. Um, further maths for year 13 and so I wasn't given a for a, a level offer because they want to know how much you can do like within a year they're not like you can do kind of seven a levels over three years but like what they want to know is how many you can do like under pressure in time limited conditions in your in your final year like that's the most important thing um because that's the most similar to what life would be like at Oxford yeah yeah definitely um, cool. And then just a question about your college. What's Corpus Christi like? So Corpus Christi is one of the smaller colleges in Oxford. In my opinion, the nicest. Now, others will disagree, but um, to me, there's a lot about it, which is just kind of ideal. Like its location is really excellent. It's right next to these amazing meadows, Christchurch meadows, where um, beautiful nature, wildlife and... Um, you can just go out and have a walk every day if you want to. It's also really central, so you're five minutes away from like the high street from the centre of town, really. But it's also kind of slightly set back from all that. It's not noisy because um, you're on this kind of Merton Street is like set back from the main high street, and it's just this beautiful part of town. Um, you, I'm sure you've, you've seen pictures of like a lot of things are filmed there because it's really picturesque, and then. It's a small college, which means there aren't that many people in it. And for me, that's really great because I know most of the people in my college um, and 
every time you go into college, every time you kind of walk around the Merton Street, the area around college, you'll see someone that you, that you can bump into and have a chat. And it's just lovely community feel. I love it for that. And yeah, the other thing about Corpus I should say is um, it's f for the number of students it has overall, there is a particularly high concentration of classicists at Corpus. <laughs> and so some say it's kind of one of the main places to study classics if you're uh, thinking about applying to Oxford. Yeah, I mean, there's a kind of running joke at Corpus that like whatever event you're at, like you'll be outnumbered by classicists <laughs> because um, yeah, it has particularly high, as I said, concentration. But you know, that does not say other colleges are like any better or worse at classics. Like it's really all about kind of how you feel you fit into the kind of um, vibe there, I guess, is, is one of the important things. Yeah, Corpus also has like a lot of kind of fun, quirky things about it. Um, so we have like a pet tortoise, uh, which is really cool. Um, and he comes out once a year at the annual, annual tortoise fair, which is actually hosted at Corpus Christi. And basically it's just a load of tortoises from different colleges around Oxford get together and have a race. Um, and then everyone comes along and spends some money and raises money for charity. And it's a really nice summary event. Um, which I'll be looking forward to hopefully next term, if such things are allowed to go ahead. But um, things like that are just wonderful. And like the gardens in Corpus are kind of unique in Oxford that the the garden has this particular style of gardening, which is quite wild. Um, so he, he will just let plants grow, you know, wildly if, if a seed like takes sprout in a certain place and he likes the look of it, he'll keep it. Um, and so it, has this kind of beautiful kind of wildness about it at the same time as the actual buildings themselves being really some of them quite old and um but again yeah just a beautiful design so it's a lovely place to hang out and spend three or four however many years of your life oh sweet that's all the questions i had i've got a few questions uh from people on instagram um so one of them is just from students taking a gap year after getting their classics offer. How would you suggest mm -hmm. they prepare for their course? So you've already got the offer, so you don't need to worry about like impressing anyone um, with what you've done in your gap year or anything like that. Um, just enjoy it. Don't waste it. Like as far as you can, don't avoid you know avoid like sitting at home doing nothing because you just regret it later in life. Um, and yeah and just read a lot um because and something i always say to people who ask about this is don't think again it's the thing of don't feel you have to read like homer and virgil and don't feel you have to get ahead of like the text that we're going to be studying once you get to oxford because you have plenty of time to do that once you're there like read stuff that really interests you no matter what it is like if it's if you're really interested in like victorian literature doesn't have to have anything obviously to do with classics but just go for it like read a lot of that because oxford the lifestyle at oxford is busy and there isn't a huge amount of free time like i remember it in my first year i hardly read anything at all during term time um and so you know you know take the opportunity to kind of build up a sort of ground knowledge of like the world um before you start to get involved in a certain field um which can be quite narrow sometimes so yeah um read widely and read whatever interests you like it doesn't matter what it is it might come in useful at some point i like that i felt that once you've got the offer and you've done your a-level exams there's not much need to really prepare for your course i yeah. was wondering whether i should prepare for my natural sciences course even the months before it started um but I, I'm glad I didn't really prepare for it because there's not a need to prepare for it. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, I mean, it's possible that your university will send you information about, um, you know, what like you need to do and in which case you should do it to best of your ability. But I would say, in my opinion, that you shouldn't do that at the expense of enjoying yourself and getting kind of broader life experience in your gap year. 
Sweet. Um, and just a related question. Do you have a like recommended reading stuff? Or is it more like just read what you're interested in? There's nothing like you need to have read. That's it. Yeah. I, I, I'll say that. Um, so yeah, to kind of reiterate what I was saying earlier, like there isn't a set amount of things that you need to read. Uh, there's no requirements. It's all about what you're interested in. Um, and it kind of doesn't matter what that is. Like, I mean, okay, probably reading about like cellular microbiology isn't going to be that relevant for classics. So don't spend too much time doing that. But like, um, if, it, if, if that is something that really interests you, maybe you're doing the wrong course, I don't know. But um, like anything, history, archeology, span philosophy any kind of literature it's all going to get you thinking in the kind of you know like scholarly way that is what um university kind of teaches you so if you can get a head start with that that's 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 wonderful um uh in terms of specific recommendations <sighs> again it's so hard to say because i might recommend something that i love and which you find completely boring and if that's the case please don't read it um, but I would say Robert Harris is the one I mentioned earlier. Um, his Cicero trilogy is, is, is just great. Um, so definitely have a look at that at least, try it out. Uh, the first one is called Imperium and what else? I mean, there's a lot of similar kind of modern literature about classics. So The Silence of the Girls by Pat Barker. Um, Circe by Madeline Miller, things like that are really great. Uh, well, that brings me to our final question, and in a way, the most important question of this oh, whole oh no. Q and A. Did you consider Cambridge? Oh, I knew it was going to be something like that. <laughs> I considered Cambridge. Um... And what made you like take the wrong path? Like, what went wrong in your decision process? <laughs> Um, well, it's because you were going there. I was like, oh, no, I don't want to do another another three years with him. No way. Um, so yeah, there are a few things. I mean, at the time, it really just came down to like the vibe, and that's so vague and probably not very helpful. But like, I'd been to Cambridge. I'd visited Cambridge because my brother was applying there, and I, you know, it's a lovely town. Beautiful, beautiful buildings, like really nice parks, all these things. But I just didn't get the sense that I really enjoyed being there. Um, and then coming to Oxford, it's completely different, like um, really exciting kind of feeling around and like all the buildings are kind of built of the same sandstone, you know, like the local rock is quite distinctive. But at the same time, there's like a huge range in what the buildings look like. And um, so it's just beautiful and it felt much more kind of like a real place than Cambridge. Cambridge, for me, uh, feels too sort of perfect and too like academic sometimes. Um, whereas Oxford feels like a city. I mean, I say that I come from Canterbury, which is like a tiny city so anywhere would feel like a city really but um you know it, it is more more like a big city than Cambridge I'd say and I mean yeah I wasn't really thinking about the course at the time um but like if I were then I would have still chosen Oxford because a the four-year thing is like such a huge boon I can't recommend it enough um and also just the way it's structured, um, the Cambridge Classics degree, as I understand it, starts with some more maybe peripheral literature, stuff that isn't so famous, um, which is really great. And I, and I really respect the idea of like trying to move away from the kind of canonical literature of Homer and Virgil, which is what we start with in Oxford. But at the same time, I felt that studying Homer and Virgil at the beginning it was kind of completely eye-opening and allowed me to understand other texts uh, in a fuller way, um, which I feel I wouldn't have got at Cambridge 
due to the way the course is structured. Um, no, I don't. Obviously, that's just speculation. But um, for me, I think the Oxford course is more suited. Cambridge. Just a bit, of shit, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Lovely. Okay. Um, <laughs> well, thank you very much, Augie, and yeah, hopefully this will be helpful to many Oxford classics applicants. I hope so. And yeah, good luck, everyone. Um, yeah. Have fun. Bye.